Hey family, hey family, welcome to week one of a brand new series we're doing. Um, Y'all, this is called Critical Race Theory and Black Faith, Double Love Experience Presents. Um, and we're doing this sermon series a little bit differently. It's gonna feel a little bit more like you're in a DLE classroom. Of course, we're gonna be blending in scripture because that's what we do. But y'all, we are a Jesus movement for black lives. Look, every, all of our stuff says it. Uh, our fans say it, our mugs say it, our t-shirts say it, we say it every week. And as a Jesus movement for black lives, we decided that it was important to engage a conversation that's already happening all around us. And that conversation is around critical race theory. Um, and so this sermon series is going to be a little bit um, of education around what critical race theory is. Um, and then it's going to be, uh, of course, your word. You're still going to get your spiritual nuggets and your wisdom from God. Uh, we're pairing it with scripture. And we're really looking to see where the two meet, right? Um, I believe this is going to be a transformative series. So I invite you even now, go ahead and share this stream. There's somebody you're connected to who needs to hear this word. Share this stream. Watch it over and over again throughout the month we're going to be giving you some content that I believe has replay value right and so you may not get everything in one shot but go back to it uh, and take a listen to it and engage the conversation in the comments on Sundays with your colleagues and friends with your family members with folks who uh, talk it out the side of their neck about critical race theory we want this to be the kind of preaching series um, that brings life and edification to you Okay, and so um, we are a Jesus movement for black lives. Uh, we, are, we are built off of the double love commandment, but we love God with our heart, our minds, our souls, and we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Amen. So that is the framework for where we are going all month. For those of you who don't know, Pastor Andrew is in the dissertation phase of a political science PhD. Y'all have a certified expert who doubles as your pastor. So we are going to do our best to unpack this thing real good. Um, and make sure that you feel connected in this preaching series. Amen. Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. That is our text for today. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. Uh, and the scripture reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen, somebody. That is our text for today, Luke chapter 4, verses 18. Those words are the words of Jesus Christ. And our topic for this week, the entire month, is called Critical Race Theory and Black Faith. But my topic for this week is intersectionality and interest convergence. And then my subtitle is, It's All Connected. Right. If you can't remember intersectionality, if you can't remember interest convergence, I want you to remember it's all connected. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have situated us within the culture, that we would not have blind eyes to what is happening around us, but that our faith might animate what we see. God, we ask that you would bless this preaching series. Be with us today as we do the digging and the hard labor of connecting the dots between what's happening in the culture, what's happening in your word, and what's happening for black folks across this globe. Have your way today. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So y'all, you have likely heard this term floating around one way or another, this term called critical race theory. Uh, now here's what's interesting about critical race theory. It might have just entered uh, your, your awareness recently, but it is a discipline that is actually nearly 40 years old. Um, it, it is a discipline that is not new, uh, but like many things, once the news cycle gets a hold of it, once the, once the folks who decide they want this to be talked about start talking about it, it feels new even if it's not. So in the month of August, we're taking the time to interrogate this terminology and to see what implications it has on black faith. If we are to be a Jesus movement committed to black lives, then we must be in dialogue with disciplines that help us understand the core concepts of what it means to be black in America. 
right? So today we are going to be in dialogue with other disciplines, but it helps us to inform and be uh, uh, more attentive to what it means to be black in America. Amen, somebody. All right? So this understanding that we're doing, this, this, this school that we've, that we've launched this month, it is critical not only to our formation as black people, but also to our identity as black Christians. All right? Let's first talk about what critical race theory is, right? Critical race theory grew from another discipline. It grew from a legal discipline. It grew from, from the topic critical legal studies, right? Where my lawyers at? If I have any lawyers in the comments, go ahead and, and throw some hands up. If I have any paralegals in the comments, go ahead and throw some hands up. So critical race theory, it, it, it comes from this critical legal studies. And critical legal studies argue that the law is not objective and the law is not apolitical, right? We're going to start there. That the law, that the way that we decide what is illegal and what's not, it is not objective and it is not apolitical. That's what critical legal studies suggest. And so the American Bar Association says that critical race theory is not diversity or inclusion training. It's not as simple as that. But it is, here it is, a practice of interrogating the role of race and racism in society. And it emerged from the legal schools and classrooms and has spread out into other disciplines. Okay. It's not just those diversity and inclusion workshops that your job makes you take. It is the literal interrogation. To interrogate is to ask questions. To interrogate is to be like, nah, I don't think that's how that works. To interrogate is what you do in the barbershop, in the hair salon, when somebody starts talking smack about your favorite artist or your favorite athlete, and they put out some, some quotes about some stats that you know aren't true or some stats that you know are taken out of context, and you're like, nah, nah, because you have to understand why they put that rule there in the first place. That's what we mean by interrogating the law, which is neither apolitical or without form or without, uh, excuse me, apolitical or, let me get the words right for you because I want to be real precise with this, or objective. That's the word I was looking for, right? Okay? So, so this practice of interrogating, this, this practice of pushback, this practice of, nah, you ain't got that right, you don't have all the facts, you don't understand, they put that in play because they wanted this to happen. That is the practice of what we are doing when we been, begin to interrogate the role of race and the role of racism in our society. Racism has a function. Race has a function. There are ways in which those who have power want to keep their power. And the best way to keep your power is to keep a lot of folks from having it. We're going to talk plainly today. The best way to make sure that you stay in power is to make sure that there aren't a whole lot of folks around you who also have power. Because if all of us have power, your power isn't as special anymore. If all of us have power, you can't lord your power over me anymore. And so I need to create a social construct that separates my power from your power so that my power can remain dominant in a world where everybody got some power. So I create ways to distinguish us so that I can say red is better than blue. There's nothing categorically different from those colors, but I need to separate myself from y'all so I can keep my power. Race is a social construct. Racism has a function. Because if I cannot be superior to anyone, then I cannot exert my power over anyone. So let me find ways to have people underneath me so that my power means something. Critical race theory suggests that this stuff did not happen by accident. Critical race theory suggests that there is a role, there is a reason for race, there is a function for racism, right? Y'all with me? 
Let's go a little bit deeper. So, so let's talk about the framework. This is week one in five weeks. So I'm going to give y'all a lot of framework this week, and we're going to keep going deeper every week. But let's talk about the framework. Critical race theory was a movement that initially started at Harvard University under Prof Professor Derrick Bell in the 1980s, right? It evolved. Uh, in reaction to critical legal studies, as I told you in the beginning, uh, critical legal studies, that comes out in the 70s. Uh, that's when they're saying, hold up, the law is not apolitical. Hold up, the law is not objective. Let's go ahead and deeper with this thing. Derrick Bell says critical race theory needed to come out and, and dissect the thing, the idea that certain laws are neutral and just. Right? Derrick Bell takes us deeper in the 1980s at Harvard and, and, and has us begin to look at, well, what is it about this idea of race uh, that, that plays into all these decisions that somehow impact people of color in ways that it does not impact Caucasian folks, right? So, so Derrick Bell begins the movement in the 80s, and then Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who's over at UCLA, uh, later on down the line in the early 90s, begins to play with uh, this idea that she coins intersectionality, right? So I've given you two names, two black scholars. I want you to write these names down. They're going to be important to you all month. Derrick Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, okay? We're starting there. We're starting there. So Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, uh, she, she begins to uh, coin uh, this term called intersectionality in 1989. And this term is Crenshaw's way of describing how race, class, gender, and other characteristics of what makes us who we are intersect and overlap with one another. Okay? So we go from critical legal studies to critical race theory to intersectionality. Y'all with me? If you're in the comments, just say, we're with you, Pastor Gabby. We're with you. All right? So, so we go from critical legal studies. We go to critical race theory. We go to intersectionality. And that suggests to us intersectionality that you can't deal with me being a woman and not deal with the fact that I'm black. You can't deal with the fact that I'm a black woman and not deal with the fact that I'm unemployed. You can't deal with the fact that I'm a black woman who's unemployed and not deal with the fact that there may be chronic illnesses that I'm battling. Crenshaw says it's all connected. And when you understand that it's all connected, you then begin to look at the prism that Derrick Bell gives us with critical race theory, and you begin to say, well, wait a minute. If they knew that this percentage of black folks were unemployed, and if they knew that this percentage of brown folks didn't have a place to lay their head, and if they knew that this percentage of black and brown folks were predisposed to different health conditions that the pandemic reminded us, though it had already existed, if they knew these things, then what? What would it look like if we were to look at the root of how certain systems are created, of how certain people are excluded, because they know that our issues intersect? What if we've been going about this all wrong? What if we've been building houses here and feeding people here? and doing hospital visits there, and not looking at the fact that all of these issues intersect. And that people who make decisions that impact our lives figured out that these things intersected a long time ago and have been using it against us. Y'all with me? Critical race theory says, uh, it's not a noun, it's a verb, um, and it says, you know, critical race theory, it cannot be confined to a static and narrow definition, but it is considered to be an evolving and malleable practice. Here it is. Here's what critical race theory does. With all that background I just gave you, it critiques how the social construction of race and institutionalized racism perpetuate a racial caste system, which means you're permanently at the top and I'm permanently at the bottom, that relegates people of color to the bottom tiers at all times. Okay? 
Critical race theory recognizes that racism is not something that no longer exists. It is not a relic of the past, but instead racism acknowledges the legacy of slavery and segregation that black folks across the diaspora have experienced and it imposes second class citizenship on black Americans and other peoples of color to keep us at the bottom of the social fabric of this nation. Somebody type, Lord have mercy. Race as a social construct. Race as a thing that people with power need to exist so that they can distinguish between who has what they need and who doesn't. It makes it, here it is, it makes it not merely the product, talking about race, racism, it makes racism not nearly the product of a few individuals who are bad apples, who don't like black and brown people. It's not that. It makes it a systematic thing where things have been set up to make folks whose race is not the predominant class be in positions that are unequal, that do not have what we need, so that people can use words like, well, that's just the way it is, and not name it as racism. It's always been that way because the plan was always to keep these folks on the lower tier. Right? All right. Okay. So, so, so here it is. Racism becomes a part of everyday life that we have all grown to accept because at some point all those years ago, race as a social construct was given to us. It was manufactured to help segment the population to keep the top at the top and the folks at the bottom at the bottom. It becomes a part of our everyday life. So people, white or non-white, don't intend to be racist, but they make choices that fuel racism because the way that the social construct has set things up, people have to work overtime not to be racist. People have to be trained not to be racist. People have to be educated out of racism because it's so embedded in America like American pie that they have to be untaught how not to be racist. Let's look at our text for today. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking, saying that God has appointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is Jesus' mission statement. This is what Jesus says right after he is baptized, before he performs any signs or wonders. This is what Jesus announces he's there for. This is the core idea of what it means to practice our faith and follow Jesus. And so if you think about critical race theory, if you think about this social construct of race, if you think about the project, the systemic project of trying to keep certain folks at the top and certain folks at the bottom, if you think about the intersectionality where all of these things that happen to us happen in cycles that keep us uh, downcast, where you might be doing well in one area but not in the other, so collectively we cannot move forward as a people. When you think about those systems, then you look at this scripture, Jesus is saying, I came to undo all that stuff y'all just created you, you critical race theory and black faith let's give it to you again when you look at the social constructs of how race is created when you look at the social constructs of what it means to keep certain people at the top and certain people at the bottom and then you hear Jesus's proclamation in Luke chapter 4 Jesus comes to undo all the systematic injustice that y'all spent all that time creating Spirit of the Lord is upon me. No, matter of fact, anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That means the poor are among us. To proclaim freedom for the prisoners. That means the prisoners are among us. To recover sight for the blind. That means the blind are among us to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and to set the oppressed free. 
That means the oppressed are among us. When you look at Luke chapter 4 verse 18, you hear directly from Jesus that the spirit of the Lord has anointed Jesus to undo all of the injustice that has happened on the other folks. Watch. While everybody was so consumed with power and while everybody was consumed with trying to figure out how they could segment the population, Jesus said, I have come so that the poor might know that they won't be poor always. I have come to economically empower the poor. Jesus says, I have come that the prisoners not be, may not be captive always, but that they might be set free. I have come that those who are blind, both literally and metaphorically, will now receive sight, will now be able to see more clearly what these systems have been set up to do against them. I have come to make sure that the oppressed go free. I have come to announce the year of the Lord's favor. You got favor on you now. God is behind you now. You ain't fighting these battles by yourself. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to tell the poor that you won't be poor always. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. It has anointed me to make sure the cat Captives go free to bring out a spirit of abolition where you ain't got to be jailed for the rest of your life, where you are not judged by the decision, the worst decision of your life. The spirit of the Lord is upon me that you might be able to see clearly that you will not be blind to the systems of injustice that have been set up to bind you and have been set up to keep you in your place. The spirit of the Lord is upon. This is Jesus work. This is. Jesus' work. Black faith takes seriously the systems of oppression that must be abolished. I'll give y'all one or two more things, and then I got to get out of your way because time is running away from me. But, but let me give you this. Let me give you this. Uh, uh, critical race scholar Kiara Bridges. That's the third name. I gave you Derek Bell. I gave you Kimberly Crenshaw. Here's the third name. Kiara Bridges. Critical race scholar Kiara Bridges outlines a few, a few key things about critical race theory. She says, this is very important. Critical race theory recognizes that race is not biologically real, but is socially constructed and therefore socially significant. Bridges says race is the product of social thought and is not connected to biological reality. And racism is a manifestation of structural and systemic racism. Right. And so when you understand that, then 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 Kiara Bridges tells us that we can't just say that racism is just a few bad apples, just a few bad cops that don't like black people, just a few racist teachers who don't want to educate our children. No, critical race theory recognizes, according to Bridges, that racism is codified in law, embedded in structures and woven into public policy. Let me say that again. Bridges says that racism is codified into law, embedded into structures, and woven into public policy. That's why black folks often feel like our backs are against the wall, and critical race theory rejects claims of meritocracy, which make it seem as though you can win your way out of this, or earn your way out of this, or learn your way out of this, and it recognizes the systemic nature of racism that decides that the responsibility for us is not to just find a few exceptional people who, who don't get bogged down by race, but to literally overturn the systems like Jesus. I don't have time to deal with the rest of it, but we got a whole month. But here's what I want you to know as we, this is the opening, opening sermon in a, in a whole month of sermons. Here's what I need you to know. Jesus said, I have come to overturn these systems of inequality. Our work is to undo the systems that seek to keep people at the lower class. Our work, 
the work of the church, if you wonder why your church that you attended from you were growing up had soup kitchens and why we had uh, clothing drives and why we had uh, Thanksgiving dinner and why we went to go visit the sick, if you wonder why we did all that, it's rooted in Luke 4.18. It is the, the, the work that we do to try to undo systemic injustice. But, but in 2021, we got to go a step further. We got to understand these concepts and undo them at the root. If you work in public policy, we need you to start undoing some of these things. If you work in the legal field, we need you to start undoing some of these things. If you are an educator, we need you to start teaching things a different way. We need everybody on the front lines to undo this work. Why? Because it doesn't only impact who we are as black people, it impacts who we are as black Christians. You see, theologically, if we really believe that Christ came to give us an abundant life, if we really believe that all all of us should have what we should what we are owing what we are due then theologically we should have problems with systems that keep certain folks at the top and certain folks at the bottom theologically we should have issues with anything that makes certain people have to fight for what is rightfully due theirs because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof everything you need the Lord has already supplied great is God's faithfulness Lord unto us there is enough for us there is enough for everybody to have what they need. So theologically, our faith ought to suggest that if you're trying to keep me out of something because you want to hoard it for yourself, that goes against what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So now I got problems with you. I got problems with your systems. I got problems with your injustice. I got problems with your laws. I got problems with your policies. I got problems with your inequality. I got problems with you, and they're theologically rooted. I ain't got problems with you because I'm a black woman who's angry. I got problems with you because I'm a black woman who's a Jesus follower and Jesus would have problems with this and Jesus would turn over these tables and Jesus would liberate the oppressed and Jesus would give sight to the blind and Jesus would let the prisoners go free and Jesus would do this work so if Jesus would do this work and I'm a Jesus follower and I'm a Jesus movement committed to black lives I got issues with anybody that's trying to make my folks be at the bottom class this is where we're going this week, this month. This is where we're going this month. I, I want to pray for us um, because this work has a lot of enemies. This sermon series has a lot of enemies already. And we're going to deal later in the month with how the same systemic injustices that they build into uh, race and racism, they try to build in the church as well. We're going to deal with that later this month with how, if we don't understand how critical race theory works, we're also not going to understand how it impacts evangelical uh, churches and how it impacts the way we believe what we are due uh, as followers of Christ. We're going to get there later on in the month. But what I need you to understand is this work has a whole lot of enemies. A whole lot of folks don't want to see you get free. So I want us to pray right now uh, that we will remain committed to the work, that we will be a church on the wall, that we will do our part in undoing these systems of injustice. Amen, somebody? We're going somewhere all month. I need you to be with us every single week. Even if you're out of town, tell your friends, tell your family at 5 o'clock. We turn it on YouTube. We turn it on Facebook. We're going to collectively, as a family, free our minds, right? Uh, and next week, we are in person, y'all. We're at the Hancock Community Garden next week, August 8th, uh, and we will be together they're doing some of this work but y'all I need you to catch every week everything is virtual except for next week but I need you to catch every week so that we can do this work together amen somebody all right let us pray God strengthen us to do the work strengthen us oh Lord to be on the wall to do Luke 4 18 work to do Jesus work to open up our eyes to the systems of inequality that have tried to keep us bound God, we know that there are enemies of this work. We know that there are people that don't want to see this work uh, go forth. But, Lord, your word says that you celebrate that the work begins. So, God, we're going to do our part. We're going to begin this work. We're going to begin being on the wall, Lord. And whatever it is you bring it into, whatever you bring us into because of this work, we will thank you. We will celebrate you. Thank you, Lord, for the folks like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and all the other scholars who have committed their lives to this work. God, we pray that you would bless them, that you would pour back into them, Lord God, that generations will rise up and call them blessed, Lord God. God, we thank you for what you are up to, and God, we ask that you would do exceedingly and abundantly 
more than we could ever think, ask, or imagine. And now, Lord, if there's somebody here who wants to know this God we serve, if there's somebody here who's curious about this God of liberation, this God who wants to bring uh, 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 sight to the blind and let the captives go free, Lord, we ask that if anybody here wants to accept you as their Lord and Savior, if anybody wants to join this church, if anybody has questions, if anybody wants prayer, God, we ask right now that you would minister to them through this screen, Lord God. Have your way, Lord God, in their lives. Transform their lives, Lord God. Put them on the battlefield for you, Lord God. God, we know that you are more than able to do it, Lord God. So we stand right now in the gap for somebody whose spirit has been pricked, whose heart has been touched, who is ready to do your work and your will, God. We pray that you might meet them at the point of their need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right now, there's a phone number on the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and text us if you need prayer, if you want to join this church, if you want to get saved. If you want to join, you can also go to doubleloveexperience.org slash join. We have good work to do. And we will do it together. Amen. So now prepare your hearts and minds for communion. Go into your uh, kitchen, whatever you may have, your bread, your juice. Uh, it's time for us to take Holy Communion together. God bless you. Join us every single week in this series. And next week we will see you outside.